UConn and Creighton were reminded how dang hard it is to win in the Big East, and the Huskies could be in even more trouble after Donovan Klingon suffered a sprained ankle. You are Locked On College Basketball, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. What's up, folks? Happy Thursday. Welcome into the Locked On College Basketball Podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. I'm your host today, Andy Patton, and this episode of Locked On College Basketball is brought to you by FanDuel. Folks, make every moment more. Right now, new customers can get $150 in bonus bets with any winning $5 money line bet. That's $150 in your pocket if your team wins. So visit FanDuel.com slash Locked On today to get started. Well, folks, we got a preview of three huge games taking place between now and Christmas Day. We also got discussion on Oregon State and Washington State joining the WCC starting in 2024-25. But first, I am thrilled and excited to get the chance to bring you recaps of what was an insane, fun, fantastic night of college basketball on Wednesday evening. We'll start with a pair of Big East games, talk about a, another pair of ACC teams beating up on the Big 12. Let's start with Seton Hall. Going to Yukon, heading to Stores, Connecticut, and blasting the Huskies 75 to 60. The final score here for Shaheen Holloway's squad. It was a fantastic all-around performance from the Pirates, but the big story coming out of this game right now is the health of Donovan Klingon. Klingon suffered what appeared to be an ankle injury, ankle foot injury uh, in the early part of the second half. He left the game. He did not return after the game. There was a report that it was a sprained ankle. We do not know the length of said injury, how long he'll be out. Klingon has, of course, dealt with foot injuries in the past, so this is something that makes it a little bit more alarming to keep track of going forward. Obviously, Klingon, a vital part of what UConn and Danny Hurley are doing this year, had a monster game against Gonzaga last week, was playing really, really well against Seton Hall, playing better than anybody else on UConn's team, and it really showed when he came out of the floor. The Pirates' defense was absolutely phenomenal in this game. UConn shot 38% from the field. They shot 19% from three, four of 21, including one of 10 in the second half. Alex Caravan did not have it. Cam Spencer did not have it. Tristan Newton, I think, had six, five, five or six turnovers in this game. Stefan Castle had three turnovers coming off the bench. UConn in total had 17. Uh, and again, part of that, a lot of that has to do with Seton Hall's fantastic defense and really the performance from Kadari Richmond. What an incredible performance from him for Seton Hall. 23 points, eight steals, almost a double-double with steals. I uh, also had six boards, five assists, was eight of 17 from the field. And it was just that kind of night for UConn. They couldn't get anything going. Again, credit Seton Hall's defense. There was a possession in the second half when UConn had a wide open three for Caravan, an opportunity to cut the lead from 12 down to nine. Uh, Caravan missed the shot. Long rebound leads to a breakout for Seton Hall. They throw down the dunk, take that 14 point lead, and you could just feel the energy completely out of the building uh, in Stores, Connecticut for the Huskies. This is their first bad loss of the season. Their only other loss was to Kansas. It's it's not an overly concerning loss in a vacuum for UConn, but the potential injury to Klingon is certainly a story to keep track of. Meanwhile, what a performance for Shaheen Holloway. They, they deserve every bit of credit for going into UConn's house and picking up a commanding 15-point victory. Well, they were not, UConn, I should say, was not the only Big East team favored to win who did not get it done. The Villanova Wildcats, Dunn, Creighton at home in overtime, 68 to 66 was the final score here. Uh, Creighton had a lead for the majority of the game, as many as 14 points. It felt like a double digit score for most of the first half, most of the second half as well. And then it got tie. It, it, it got close around the eight minute mark, I think, in the second half, pretty much trading buckets back and forth from there, or I should say trading a lot of misses. There weren't a whole lot of points scored in the last 10 minutes of regulation in this game, but with the score tied 58-50, 58, 31 and a half seconds left. Creighton has the ball. 
They missed the shot. Ball goes out of bounds. It looked like it was off Creighton. They rule the ball, stays with Creighton, but they're unable to score. Ball go, Game goes into overtime. And then in overtime, both teams kind of felt like they weren't trying to win this thing. Eric Dixon hit a three to give Villanova a two-point lead with 30 seconds left in overtime. That was Villanova's first lead since the 15-minute mark in the first half. That is an insane stat for Villanova to finally come back, take the lead. At that point, Villanova had an opportunity to put it away at the free throw line, missed the front end of the one and one. Eric Dixon inexplicably fouled Baylor Shireman when he had a chance to go to the free throw line in a one and one situation when Creighton was down two. Shireman then missed the front end. Tyler Burton gets the rebound for Villanova. He gets fouled, and then he misses the front end of the one-and-one. One. It was a spectacular display of ineffective free-throw shooting from both teams. Fortunately for Villanova, Shireman got another chance at a three, missed it. In fact, he did not make a single three in this game. Creighton as a team, five of 24. The combination of Shireman, Trey Alexander, and Stephen Ashworth combined two of 16 from three. That is not going to get it done for a Blue Jays team that relies heavily on that outside shooting. Villanova, all their damage was done by Eric Dixon, 32 points on 12 of 21 shooting, including 4 of 10 from 3. Villanova's entire rest of their team had 36 points on 33% shooting. A monster performance from Dixon in a monster game for Villanova. They now pick up a much-needed win, giving themselves some confidence going into the Big East play. Meanwhile, Creighton suffers their third loss, their second in their last three games. They had that loss to UNLV. Early in the season, they had that bad loss to Colorado State. None of those losses are terrible, but now with Creighton having some inexplicably stagnant offensive performances, you got to start to wonder what this team's ceiling really is, especially seeing the way they've played the last couple of games. A couple more games to get to to preview here, or excuse me, to review here after a again a fantastic night of college basketball. Duke beats Baylor and North Carolina takes care of Oklahoma, a pair of ACC teams, true blue bloods taken down uh, a, pro a pair of programs in the Big 12 Conference. Duke beats Baylor 78 to 70 behind a really nice game from Jared McCain, 21 points and three assists for him on seven of 11 shooting. Uh, it was a close game throughout, but Duke had a pair of nine nothing runs, one in the middle of the second half, one towards the end of the second half. I think Baylor didn't score a field goal for about a four minute stretch in the in the latter half of the second half. That's not gonna get it done if you can't convert at the end of the game. Really nice stuff from Duke's bigs, Kyle Filipowski, 13 and 10. Ryan Young gave Duke some really nice minutes off the bench as well. Uh, a, a nice performance from Duke. They rarely lose at the Madison Square Garden. Meanwhile, Baylor now has the second consecutive loss after losing to Michigan State. Neither of these losses are terrible, again, in a vacuum. They did not play, play well against Michigan State in the first half. Had plenty of opportunities to win this one. I'm sure Scott Drew is going to be kicking themselves for not being able to get this one done. And then North Carolina ends the undefeated season for Porter Mosier and Oklahoma, 81-69. Uh, North Carolina led it. They jumped out to a 14-2 lead, and Oklahoma made multiple attempts to get back into the game and never really got that close. It was kind of a professional performance from Hubert Davis and the Tar Heels to build a lead early and then just hold on to it. They were up by eight at halftime, and the game never got – I think there was a point where it was a six-point lead for North Carolina at one point in the middle of the second half. But other than that, North Carolina – Carolina pretty much always kept the Sooners at bay. R.J. Davis, fantastic in this one. 23 points, five assists, four boards, and three steals for Oklahoma. They didn't shoot it well, 40% from the field, 30% from three. They also had 18 turnovers, just the kind of stuff you can't do if you want to beat a team like the Tar Heels, who especially in the second half got really hot, seven of 12 from three from beyond the arc in that second half. Oklahoma clearly proved they, be they belong in this conversation. They didn't look completely overmatched by North Carolina's size and skill, but we're not surprised to see that that undefeated season come to an end. Doesn't necessarily mean anything bad for Oklahoma, although uh, it will be very interesting to see how they do night in and night out competing in the Big 12 Conference. Well, a report indicated the WCC is going to vote to approve both Oregon State and Washington State as affiliate members in basketball for both the 2024-25 and 2025-26 seasons. What does it mean for the WCC? Could it impact Gonzaga's quest for conference realignment? More coming up on that 
after a word from today's sponsor, LinkedIn Jobs. Folks, these days, every new potential hire can feel like a high stakes wager for your small business. You want to be 100% certain that you have access to the best and most qualified candidates available. And that's why you have to check out LinkedIn Jobs, which helps find the right people for your team faster. And they do it for free. It's super easy to create a free job post. And all you do is add your job in the purple hashtag hiring frame to your LinkedIn profile to spread the word that you're hiring. From there, simple tools like screening questions make it easy to focus on candidates who have just the right skills and experience so that you can quickly prioritize who you'd like to interview and ultimately hire. It's why small businesses rate LinkedIn Jobs number one in delivering quality hires versus the leading competitors. LinkedIn Jobs helps you find the qualified candidates you want to talk to faster. So post your job for free at linkedin.com slash college. That's linkedin.com slash college to post your job for free. Terms and conditions apply. All right, folks, I want to thank all of you for making Locked On College Basketball your first listen or your first watch of the day. Shout out to those everyday listeners. Shout out to those of you hanging out with us in the Discord channel. Had a lot of fun chatting about these epic games on Wednesday evening. We'll be back every night for the season talking college hoops. So if you want to join us there, it is free. And there is a link to join in the show notes. Want to pivot to the big story that happened on Wednesday afternoon. It was announced I saw this report from Matt Norlander of CBS that the WCC is planning to vote on adding both Oregon State and Washington State as affiliate members into the conference for the next two school years. That would be 24-25 and 25-26. The expectation, again, according to Norlander, is that this is going to be voted and approved on Thursday morning. So as we're recording this on Wednesday evening, it has not been finalized. By the time you're listening to it, there is a a good chance that it is official and approved. Uh, This is a surprise. This is not something that many people were expecting or anticipating. It had been floated around. It had been discussed. But the expectation after these two schools, the the PAC-2 in Oregon State and Washington State, had negotiated a scheduling agreement with the Mountain West for football for the next couple of years. They'd been working with them on potentially negotiating some uh, some kind of agreement with the rest of the sports, too. And everybody kind of expected that the, the next announcement we would hear is either a merger or a reverse merger of sorts between the Pac-2 and the Mountain West. But that did not happen. And Norlander m- mentioned in his article that there are logistical and ongoing legal concerns making a move difficult right now. There's a lot to to, to kind of read into that there. Ultimately, I don't know how many details we'll ever actually get, but it didn't make sense for Oregon State and Washington State to work with the Mountain West in other sports right now. That is what we know. And Stu Jackson, the new commissioner of the WCC, taken over for Gloria Navarra as the commissioner of the Mountain West, swooped in and stole these two programs and added them to the WCC. They will be affiliate members in every sport except football, of course, because the WCC does not offer football and baseball. Interestingly enough, as Oregon State and Washington State have chosen to uh, keep their baseball programs independent for the time being, WCC does offer baseball, does have pretty good baseball, but that is not the direction those two programs are going. But from a men's basketball perspective, there is a lot of intrigue and excitement and fun about this potential move. Obviously, Gonzaga is the biggest name, brand, recognizable team in the in the WCC right now. And now they add a regional rival in Washington State. Pullman, Washington, Spokane, Washington, about 75 miles away from each other, uh, just down one highway, very close. They used to play each other every single year. They have stopped doing that. I believe they stopped back in 2015. And now that rivalry will be back. These two teams will get cracks at each other, at least for 24-25. The expectation, uh, if Gonzaga does make a move out of the conference, is that it wouldn't happen before 24-25. I suppose you never know, but that seems unlikely by the day. So it looks like at least for one year, these two teams are going to be in the same conference. Uh, WCC grows from 9 to 11 in basketball, much needed after losing BYU uh, this past offseason to the Big 12. Uh, It adds brand recognition for the WCC. People know Oregon State, Washington State. They're the two biggest arenas in the conference, the two biggest alumni bases, donor bases, all of those kind of valuable intangibles that programs like that, even if they're not particularly great men's basketball programs, they can bring a lot of other things. Again, the recognition, scheduling appeal, all sorts of stuff kind of in that vein. 
It is expected that this will change the league schedule from 16 games to either 18 or 20 conference matchups at the WCC tournament, which is currently structured for a double buy, which was basically at the request of Gonzaga. That will likely change the way that uh, NCAA tournament payouts are done. Uh, that is going to change as well for those units that, again, Gonzaga has kind of requested to get a bigger piece of that pie because of how they have how many NCAA tournaments they have made and how many uh, tournaments the rest of the WCC has made. All of that stuff is going to change. And so I think the, the conversation of like, oh, Gonzaga's going to be happy because the WCC is getting better. That's not necessarily how they're going to look at this. Uh, again, it's not like Washington State and Oregon State dramatically improve the men's basketball. Wazoo does. They are good. They are the sec third best team in the WCC behind Gonzaga and a struggling St. Mary's team. Oregon State is still probably fifth or sixth, but that says more about the weakness of the WCC this year in particular. Uh, in years past, Oregon State would be like eighth uh, in, 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 the, in the most recent years at least. So I don't know that it moves the needle a ton from a men's basketball perspective in the next two years uh, and some of the downsides for Gonzaga. Ultimately, if, if Gonzaga gets invited to the Big 12 or if the Big East comes calling and wants, it, wants a piece of Gonzaga, they're going to go. Like there's, this is not going to to slow them down. They're not going to say, well, we were going to go to the Big 12 and take the offer that they were making us, but now we might get to play Oregon State. Like that's not going to change their mind. That's not going to change uh, the the path that they're on of of continuing to explore alternate options uh, for their program. And again, in the Big 12, Brett Yormark, the commissioner, absolutely loves Gonzaga. He is steadfast in his desire to add this program. He has made that very, very clear. There was like a three-week period of time where he said, hey, we're done talking about realignment. And after three weeks, it came out that he was still pushing to get Gonzaga added. He is relentless in trying to add the Bulldogs. There are clearly programs in the Big 12 that do not want to add Gonzaga. Uh, some of them probably won't ever want to vote Gonzaga in. Some of them, I think, were just like, hey, we just added the four corner schools in Arizona, Arizona State, Colorado, and Utah, and we haven't even gotten them into the into the house yet. Let's wait till we get that figured out, figure out what that looks like from a financial perspective, scheduling perspective, all that jazz. And then we can kind of reconvene and determine if we want to vote Gonzaga. And, and that's how uh, multiple schools in the Big 12 feel, where Gonzaga is trying to put pressure on them. And this helps in that regard. It makes their conference a little stronger. It makes it a more viable option for them. And again, while the basketball isn't there in a significant way, Washington State's currently 65th in Ken Palm as we're recording this right now. They're 8-2 and two on the year. That would put them third in the WCC behind Gonzaga and St. Mary's. And St. Mary's, as recently as Tuesday, was not above 65th in Ken Palm. They absolutely blasted Middle Tennessee State. That bumped them up into the low, uh, the, I think, the low 50s in Ken Palm rankings. So now they are ahead of where Wazoo is, San Francisco, uh, as 70th as we're recording this, so just behind Washington State. Uh, Wazoo recently played Santa Clara. They lost, but it was a close, hard-fought game. That's the kind of matchup that I think uh, is enviable for the WCC. They want good matchups like Wazoo-Santa Clara. I think that helps them, uh, again, as a brand. And, and just more butts and seats. Gonzaga fans in particular, there's a bunch of them in the Portland metropolitan area. I know that because I am a Gonzaga alumni who lives in the Portland metropolitan area, and they pack the house when Gonzaga plays Portland at the Child Center every year. Now they get an opportunity potentially to play at Gill Coliseum in Corvallis, where Oregon State is. Spokane area Zags almost never get opportunities to go play to go watch Gonzaga play at the Kennel because that building has been sold out for like 15 years but they can make the trip to Pullman, Washington to watch the Zags in Pullman against Washington State. They're going to be met with a little hostility, but that's kind of the fun, right? That's what makes it exciting. So I'm excited about this. I think this is a fun opportunity for the WCC. They needed to do something. They were down to nine members. The you know conversations around Seattle U and Cal Baptist just weren't really moving the needle in a way that, that would have really generated any kind of excitement, but for them to be able to swoop in, add these programs, uh, the, these it's a really nice addition for women's basketball as well. Wazoo and Oregon State are both top 30 teams in the net. That's a huge addition for Gonzaga's women's team, which is very good, but got hurt by the lack of strength in the WCC last year. So there are a lot of positives for this move for the WCC. I don't think that it changes Gonzaga's ultimate quest to potentially join the Big 12 or, again, the Big East if they show any interest. But it is a, a fun thing that's going to alter the landscape of college basketball, particularly on the West Coast uh, in the coming years.
We're going to close out the show, discuss previewing, I should say, a trio of very exciting games coming up this weekend, including an in-state rivalry that could be the end of Kenny Payne's career at Louisville. We're going to talk about all of that after a word from today's sponsor, FanDuel. Folks, FanDuel as the weather gets colder, the college basketball offers stay hot on FanDuel. Right now, new customers can get $150 in bonus bets with any winning $5 money line bet. That's $150 in your pocket if your team wins. So if you've been thinking about joining FanDuel, there is no better time than right now to get in on the action. The FanDuel app is super easy to use, and there is a wide range of betting options, which includes spreads, player props, over-unders, and more. As we get into our preview of this Kentucky-Louisville game, Kentucky is currently favored by 14.5 points against Louisville. I'm not sure that's high enough. If you agree with me, head to FanDuel.com slash locked on and get in on the action this college basketball season. FanDuel, an official partner of the NFL. All right, folks, closing out the show today with a trio of game previews. Uh, first one here is on Thursday, as you're listening to this tonight, 6 p.m. Eastern time, December 21st at the KFC Yum Center, where Kenny Payne and the Louisville Cardinals will host John Calipari and the Kentucky Wildcats, Kentucky number eight in our weekly rankings here for Locked On College Basketball. Again, the FanDuel line for that is 14 and a half in favor of Kentucky. And the question for this game from a preview perspective is not whether who's going to win, what Louisville needs to do to win. Like those, you maybe you can ask those questions if you're really confident that Louisville can pull this thing off. But for me, the main question I have is whether this is going to be Kenny Payne's last game on the sideline for Louisville. Because they've made it clear in the front office that, or in the athletic department, they've made it clear that they don't plan to keep Kenny Payne for the rest of the year. They don't want to drag this out. That has been said. That has been explained. But yet they haven't actually made the decision to fire him. Kenny Payne went 4-28 and in his first season as the head coach of Louisville last year in 22-23. This year he's 4-5-6 and I think five and six now after the win over Pepperdine. Uh, really bad losses to DePaul, bad loss to Arkansas State. They've played well in a handful of games, but Kenny Payne has, you know, he talked to the press about how Indiana's press confused him. That was, I think he was trying to make a joke, but it wasn't a good look uh, considering the circumstances, the situation with Karan Davis. Uh, transfer junior college transfer who never ended up suiting up for Louisville and then reported that he didn't transfer when they reported that he did. And then they said, oh, we kicked him out of school or we kicked him off the team. It was a whole just weird, poorly handled situation, whether Davis, uh, you know, deserved to be on the team still or not. We don't know all the details there, but the way that it was handled was, was quite poorly done. And that amongst just everything else that has happened in the Kenny Payne era, it is time for this to be done. Louisville is a proud, proud college basketball program. They are a, a, a stalwart in this game and, and they have not looked even close to that level in the last two years. And now Kentucky is going to come to town and, probably beat them pretty badly. Maybe maybe they will put up a fight. Maybe they will keep this thing close. Who knows? Kentucky has has showed some, some serious flaws. They're a team full of freshmen, perhaps. Uh, the environment might get to them a little bit. I'm hard-pressed to imagine there's going to be a lot of screaming Cardinals fans at this game, but hey, you never know. It certainly could happen. But uh, at, at this point, my main curiosity for this game is whether Kenny Payne is going to be coaching the next time Louisville plays, which is on January 3rd on the road at Virginia. That is a long gap between December 21st and January 3rd, whole bunch of time for this team to potentially find a interim coach who can take over for the rest of the year while they conduct a nationwide search in the off season. We're going to have conversations if slash when this goes down for Louisville about who some of their options might be, what they can do to potentially right the ship here and get this once proud program kind of back to being uh, one of the best teams in the ACC and one of the best teams in college basketball. But uh, from the Kentucky side, excited to see what Aaron Bradshaw can do as he continues to get more comfortable, uh, only just returning a few games ago for Kentucky, uh, the three headed guard mom monster of DJ Wagner, Reed Shepard, and Rob Dillingham has been, I mean, those that's three freshman point guards who are probably all going to be first round picks. That is just an obscene amount of talent in the backcourt for John Calipari. Always fun to see how those guys play out, uh, especially in a game like this against, uh, frankly, a team like this uh, in Louisville. 
Next up in terms of preview is Arizona versus Florida Atlantic. This game will take place on the 23rd at 3 p.m. Eastern time in Las Vegas. As we are recording right now, Arizona is locked in a battle with Alabama. It is 41 to 39 heading into halftime for the Wildcats. Uh, so we, we will see if they are coming into this game on a two game winning or two game losing streak, if they potentially get clipped here by Alabama or if they manage to redeem themselves for that loss to Purdue by beating Alabama and then heading into this matchup against Florida Atlantic. Either way, uh, Tommy Lloyd's team is in the middle of a ridiculous stretch of games. They blew out Wisconsin. They lost to Purdue. Again, they're locked in this game with Alabama as I'm recording right now. And then, of course, they'll have Florida Atlantic. The Owls, fantastic program as well. They Since their loss to Bryant early in the season, which certainly raised some eyebrows. It, it validated a lot of people who, who felt like FAU's run was maybe fluky and that they shouldn't be in the top 25 conversation to begin the season. Once they lost to Brian, a lot of people felt like they were right. Since that loss, FAU has gone seven and one. Their only loss is to a top 15 team in Illinois. They have wins over previously ranked Texas A&M. They have a win over Virginia Tech. They have wins over very, very good mid-major programs in Charleston, Liberty, and St. Bonaventure. They got a win over Butler, who's having a nice season in the Big East. This FAU team is legit. They are for real. Uh, these two teams are top 10 teams in the country offensively. Arizona's sixth in adjusted offensive efficiency at Kempom. Florida Atlantic is seventh. The main difference between them is that Arizona's third in defensive efficiency, while FAU is 41st. That's going to be the question. We know FAU can score. We know Arizona can score. Can FAU score? Can, can FAU stop Arizona enough? So that they, or, or they're going to have to score 120 <laughs> unless they can do that. Arizona is going to be a team that scores 95 plus. They've been doing it pretty much every single game. That's going to be the big storyline in this game. Really balanced scoring from both teams too. I think that makes this an intriguing matchup. Arizona, all five of their starters are incredibly even. Caleb Love leading the team in scoring, but only barely. After, after that, basically all four of the rest of the starters in Pella Larson, Kashad Johnson, Umar Balo, and Keelan Boswell all around the same points per game. Meanwhile, FAU, Vlad Golden, 15-7 and seven for him. Fantastic season as their big man. John L. Davis, big star last year, 14.5 points, seven boards, 2.5 assists for him. Elijah Martin right behind. These three guys are, are fantastic, and it's going to be a fun matchup to see kind of Arizona's really stout starting five and that returning group for FAU. And, of course, a, a battle of great young coaches in Tommy Lloyd and Dusty May as well. Closing it out, St. John's at UConn. That is going to also be on the 23rd at 8 p.m. Eastern time. And right now the momentum is not in the order that you would expect it to be. St. John's beat Xavier in their Big East opener, 81-66. Joel Soriano, fantastic performance, 18 points, 14 boards, and five assists against Xavier. Meanwhile, UConn had that listless struggle against Seton Hall, got held to 60 points, and Donovan Klingon, we don't know if he's going to play against St. John's. My guess, just based on the limited amount of knowledge that we have as I'm recording this on Wednesday evening, is probably not. But if he's able to go, that is a huge boost for UConn if he's at or close to 100%. If he is not, either he's not at 100% or not able to go, Soriano might feast against UConn. UConn's got talented backup bigs. It's not like their depth is a complete issue necessarily, but... No Donovan Klingon is a big problem for UConn and, and certainly against the the most, if one of, if not the most talented big that they're going to face in the Big East all year long in Joel Soriano. So that's going to be a huge storyline to monitor over the next couple of days as we get towards that matchup on Saturday. Uh, St. John's has been kind of quietly good. They had a ton of preseason hype. They didn't quite match the like, they're automatically going to be a top 25 team because Rick Pitino's there type of energy that they were getting. But at the same time, this team only has three losses. One of them's to Michigan. One of them's to Dayton. Those are both probably NCAA tournament teams. The other one's Boston College. And yeah, that's a that's a stinger of a loss. That's not one that's going to help you very much if you're Coach Patino. But this is a team that has been solid throughout the year. They're absolutely capable of clipping UConn. And right now, if you're Danny Hurley, you know you can't go 0-2 to start Big East play. You know, this team's going to rebound even if that happens. They're going to be fine. It's not the end of the world but you can't go 0-2 to start Big East play. You just can't. The Big East is so good and so tough. And if they do that, if they go 0-2 and the first two teams they play in Big East are Seton Hall and St. John's, that's a rough start for them. 
Certainly, UConn has the ability, even without Klingon, to win this game. They are so deep. Cam Spencer and Alex Caravan aren't going to shoot as poorly as they did against Seton Hall very often. Tristan Newton was was very good in that game outside of the turnovers and, and continues to be one of the best point guards in the Big East and in all of college basketball. Uh, Stefan Castle is still kind of finding his way, so certainly there's some optimism if you're UConn, but uh, th- this game is is. Go, heading into that game on Saturday, the momentum is definitely with St. John's after that win over Xavier and, and with the injury to Klingon for the Huskies. It's going to wrap us up for today here on the Locked On College Basketball Podcast. Thank you so much for making this show your first listen or your first watch of the day. My co-host Isaac Shade and Leaf Tulin will be back on Friday with a fun conversation about the who who is kind of in that All-American conversation so far this season. So check that one out as we get in into the final week before the Christmas break. Thanks again for making the show your first listen or your first first watch of the day. And until tomorrow, as always, peace out.